All right, so good afternoon, everybody. So as Lisa said, I'm João Paulo. I work as a software engineer in the Bluetooth team at INDT. Uh, I've been working lately with the audio support for uh, IVI-related profiles and also with Bluetooth Low Energy, which I'll we'll talk about a little bit today. So INDT is a research institute which is funded by Nokia. We have four sites around Brazil. I work in the Recife site on the far north, northeast in the OSS and user interaction area. Today I'll talk a little bit, the, uh, a small introduction to Bluetooth Low Energy. I'll show you how devices discover and connect to each other. I'll talk a little bit about the protocols and profiles we have for Bluetooth Low Energy and what's the current support on Linux. So does anybody here have no idea what Bluetooth is? I hope not. <laughs> okay. So just to remember the past, Bluetooth was designed to substitute cables when you're connecting peripherals to a central computer. So it was designed with short distances in mind. It provides a high level of security and was created in 1994 by Ericsson. Later on in June 2010, uh, the version 4.0 of the specification was adopted. It, fo it focused on low power uh, consumption, so it enables devices that are powered with coin cell batteries to communicate with Bluetooth. The aim is to have these devices, uh, th their battery lasting for a year to two years. So it has also faster connection establishment. Uh, this, the, the connection phase is one of the, the phases that consumes a lot of power in the, the Bluetooth communication. So they, they change the radius a little bit, so the radius of the two devices synchronize faster, so they, they spend less time in the connection phase, so they save power this way. Uh, so it provides a 200 kilobits data rate and about a range of about 50 meters. And the radio is shared with classic Bluetooth. This is good because it reduces uh, hardware cost, but also uh, since the radio is shared, some operations cannot be done in parallel. For example, you cannot uh, try to discover LE devices and classic Bluetooth devices at the same time because the, the radio parameters are a bit different for these two discoveries. Uh, the market they are aiming is mainly to, to conquer these three last markets there, fitness and wellness, medical devices and sensors and automation devices and expanding their use over the consumer electronics, PCs, and mobile phones. You may have seen this branding using somewhere already. Uh, for Bluetooth Low Energy devices, they came up with these new names. So they're calling Bluetooth Smart, the devices, the, the peripherals that uses Bluetooth Low Energy only and Bluetooth Smart Ready, a central device that is able to talk with Bluetooth Smart devices. So it was a bit confusing in the beginning when they came up, came up with these new names. But now, mostly in the market, they are selling devices using this branding. Um, okay, so the discovery and connection of Bluetooth Low Energy devices. There is a profile that's used to specify how Bluetooth, how Bluetooth devices find each other and connect to each other. It's called a generic access profile. So it basically defines procedures for central devices to find the, the device they want to connect to and for the connection to be established. And it also defines how the security is, is involved in, in this process. So the generic access profile defines four roles. The center and peripheral, which talk to each other in a connection-oriented way, and broadcaster and observer, which talk to each other in a connection-less way. 
So when you, we are using the central peripheral role, uh, the central role is the one that scan to find LE devices around it. Uh, this scan can only find LE devices. It's concurrent with BRDR inquire, which is how the, the BRDR device discovery is called. BRDR is the classical Bluetooth. Uh, and it has configurable parameters. So there is the interval between two scanning windows start that can be configured, and also the time that scanning is happening. So let's say we have an interval of five seconds and I scan a window of two seconds, then it, the, the hardware is going to be scanning for two seconds, and then on the next three seconds of the interval, it's gonna be off. And then after that three seconds, it's gonna start another scanning window. If you want it to scan continuously, you just give a window an interval of the same size. And the, the peripheral can indicate its presence, presence broadcast, broadcasting some small data packets, which we call advertising reports. So advertising reports are used for the peripherals to indicate their, their presence, and also they let the central device know what's the connection mode they are. There are four different connection modes. The device can be in the connectable undirected mode where it shall accept a connection coming, a, a connection request coming from a central device. The connectable directed mode where it shall accept a connection request coming from a known peer device. So the connectable directed has a, a, a MAC address associated with it. There is the scannable and directed where the device shall not accept an incoming connection request from a, a peer device, but it shall respond uh, scan requests with scan responses. So a scan request is a, a data packet where the central device requests more information about the peripheral device. And the last one is the non-connectable and directed where it shall not accept incoming connections, neither answer scan requests. After the devices find each other, they can start a connection establishment procedure. There are three different connection establishment procedures defined in the specification. The direct connection establishment procedure, it's basically you just send a connection request uh, message to the peripheral device and then the peripheral answered that, that request. The general and the auto connection establishment procedures they are used for either automatic connections or reconnections. So you have a list where you put your, the device you're interested to connect to in, and then the system starts scanning, and when one of these devices entering range, it sends the connection request package to it. So the difference between the general and the auto connection is that in the general connection, all device found events are sent to the host, and the host has to, to select, to, to check if that device is one of the devices he's interested in and send the connection commands. On the auto connection uh, establishment procedure, all of this is done inside the, the hardware. So the filtering is done by the hardware firmware and the host is only awake when the connection is established. Is established, established. On the security side, uh, we have the security manager protocol, which is used to do all the security negotiation of the, the stream encryption. It provides payload encryption and payload authentication. All the security manager protocol calculations are mostly done in the central device, which usually has a better hardware and has more power available, so you can have savings on the, on the peripheral device. Also, it supports uh, hardware, module, hard, hardware encryption modules, so it can, on the peripheral, it, uh, it can be done in hardware to save power as well. Uh, and there are three authentication methods that can be used for peer authentication. The just, work, just works method, it doesn't provide man-in-the-middle protection, 
the passkey entry method and the out of band method provides man in the middle protection. So the passkey entry, you enter passkey, the same passkey on both sides, on both devices, and the out of band, you use another channel to authenticate the, the peer device. So it could be over NFC or over a, a cable. So GAP defines also the broadcaster and observer roles, which are mainly used for connectionless, undirected data transfers. Uh, so it's always small data that is transferred. Uh, generally, it's if you can do something around 27, 27 bytes per advertising report, if you can send. Could be a little more of that if there is some profile that is defined by the Bluetooth SIG, but at the moment, no profile is defined. So mainly, it's used for uh, manufacturer-specific use cases. So it, some of the use cases that can be covered with this rules are when you have a sensor, uh, like for example, a, a room temperature sensor advertising the room temperature. So any observer device could uh, get this information. Also for information advertisement in transport hubs or uh, shopping malls, advertising discounts, this kind of, of things. So now I'm gonna show you the protocol stack and profiles that are defined for the central peripheral role. So this is the basic Bluetooth LE Energy profile stack. Uh, everything that's on white there on, on the bottom is inside the hardware. On top of that, there is the host controller interface, which is implemented by the hardware firmware, and provide it's uh, a well-defined interface that all Bluetooth adapters has to implement to be compliant with the Bluetooth spec. And then we have the L2CAP protocol, which, which is the transport protocol for Bluetooth. It's shared with classic Bluetooth. It's, it basically provides the same features as the TCP provides on the TCP stack. And on top of that, all of them uh, were defined together with the Bluetooth 4.0 specification. So the attribute protocol, uh, then on top of, uh, I'll talk about them individually later on. So each of them provides services for the upper layers. So the attribute protocol is a protocol designed with small data transfers in mind. It works in a client-server model, so the client can read, write, and be notified of changes of values in attributes on the server side. So attributes are basically a pair of a type and a value. And so you have a well-defined types for these attributes with, with UIDs uh, assigned by the Bluetooth SIG. And on the, the attributes database on the server, each attribute has a handle which is used to address the, those attributes. Then the attribute protocol is used by the generic attribute profile, which tries to organize these attributes in the database. So it, the attributes are basically grouped, grouped in something bigger called characteristics. So the characteristics has uh, a declaration attribute, which has the UID of that characteristic, and also uh, access control mode for that characteristic. It has a value attribute, where the value related to that characteristic is stored and it could have one or more descriptors describing the data on that characteristic or some, some other, it's, it's like metadata about that, that main data. So for example, it could be used to specify what units are used in some kind of measurement provided in the, in the characteristic and this kind of things. And also characteristics are then grouped in bigger sets called services. So basically a service is a, a 
group of characteristics that is defined in a specification. But to make it more concrete, I brought an example here. So on the first line, we have first the handle, which will be the address of that attribute, 0023. And then the type is 2800, which is the UIG for the primary server services service. So it's a service declaration here. And the service we, were de we are declaring here, it's a link loss service, which the UID is 1803. On the second line, there is the first characteristic of the link loss service on the handle 24. So the UID is 2803, which is a characteristic declaration. And the characteristic declaration has their value well defined. So the first byte indicates the access, the, the properties of the characteristic, which says how can you access that characteristic. So for this characteristic specifically, specifically, we can read the value and we can write and get a response from that write. So the attribute protocol provides two types of writing mechanisms, one with a response and one without a response. So this characteristic supports only the write with response method. So the, the next two bytes of the characteristic declaration indicates the address of that, the value attribute of that characteristic, which here is on the handle 25. And the last two bytes indicates the UID of that characteristic. So here it's 2A06, which is a alert level characteristic, which is one of the characteristics that's part of the link loss service. And finally, on the third line, we have handle 25 we, with the value of that characteristic. So the, the UIG is 2A06, which indicates the alert level characteristic again. And the value is 2, that for this characteristic means alert level high. So this is basically how, how every uh, GAT service is grouped and defined. So some of the profiles that are defined by the Bluetooth stick at the moment, one of them is the proximity profile where you, you have two roles involved. One is the proximity reporter and the other is the proximity monitor. So when these two devices distance from each other, an alert is emitted on the reporter side. The alert level is configurable. It's exactly the characteristic I showed you before. So you write on that characteristic to, to say what level of alert do you wanna hear. And there are two, me two mechanisms defined to, to, like to tell this, this difference. One of them is the link loss, which is uh, expose it through the link loss service uh, I have shown you before. So the, basically, with this mechanism, when the link is actually down, the alert is emitted, and the other one is path loss. With the path loss method, there is a calculation based on the transmission power between the two devices, and, and the, the transmission power in the origin and the, the signal strength in the receiving side, so they can uh, estimate the distance between them and uh, when it goes under a, a certain threshold, the alert is emitted and this threshold is configurable. So another service is the find me profile. It's very similar to the proximity one, but instead of relying on the distance to emit an alert, you rely on uh, user interaction. So it also has an alert level characteristic and when one of the sides writes, a value on that alert level characteristic, the alert is emitted on the receiving side. So it can be used for you to find something you lost, like your keys or something like this, and you have a, your, your phone, and you can send a command on your phone to, to, for your keys to, to emit an alert. And the alert level is also configurable. There's a profile for uh, heart, heart rate devices as well. So there is the heart rate sensor, which is the belt for, for measuring heart rate. And the collector is the side that receives the, the heart rate measurements. Uh, 
besides the heart hate information itself, there can be the energy expanded field, which is basically a, a counter of how much energy you have spent from, from a certain point of time. And the RR interval, which is the, the time between two heartbeats. And all of, if this data are sent or not with the measurement, is, is it can be configured by the collector side. So that's one example of how descriptors can be used. There's a descriptor which can be written to configure the actual data coming out of the sensor. So there's also another characteristic that provides body sensor location. And the, the energy expanded uh, counting can be reset by the, the collector uh, writing on a different characteristic. So the health thermometer profile is very similar to the heart height profile. Basically there's a body thermometer which sends the body temperature at periodic intervals. This interval can be configured. There's a profile for encapsulating uh, HID protocol inside of attributes, which is used for human interface devices with, with low, uh, low energy consumption. Uh, basically, there is a characteristic for the heat report and every time a new heat report wants to be sent, that of the value of that characteristic changes. So a notification of that change is sent to the, to the host, and then the host can read the characteristic. Uh, and also there is a descriptor which stores the, I'm, I'm sorry, the, yeah, a descriptor which stores the HID descriptor. No, a characteristic that stores the HID descriptor. It's called report map. So it's basically, you can obtain all this information through GET and inject it on your regular HID subsystem. The time profile is used for time synchronization. The client synchronizes its time information with the server. Uh, it provides local time information, time zone information, and DST offset. The, the current DST offset. All right, and the current status of the support on Linux. Bluetooth Flow Energy is enabled by default in the kernel, from the kernel 3.5. 3, 3, 3 uh, and for older kernels, there was a parameter, a module parameter called enable LE. So if you are using an older kernel and want to check if there is the experimental support for Bluetooth Flow Energy, you can look for this module. But I recommend if you want to really use Bluetooth Flow Energy, get a kernel, a recent kernel. For device discovery, we support LE-only scanning and also a thing called interleaved discovery, which is a suggest, uh, suggestion of the spec for doing uh, Bluetooth Flow Energy scanning for 5.12 seconds and then doing VR and DR inquiring for the next 5.12 seconds. So this way you can look for both kinds of devices in a short time slot. Uh, on the connection front, we support the direct connection establishment procedure in the kernel. So basically you have an L2CAP socket where you can issue a connect system call and it will send a connect request to the remote device. We also have the general connection establishment procedure implemented in user space inside the Bluetooth daemon. And it, right now it's only used for profiles that require automatic reconnections. And the automatic connection procedure is not supported at all at the moment. The security manager protocol is, is supported and we supported the just works and the passkey entry authentication method. We support all the profiles I, I talked about before, the proximity, but the, for the proximity we don't support the path loss services, we just support the link loss services. We support the find me profile, the heart hate profile, health thermometer, 
hit over get time, and also the cycling speed and cadence profile, which is used to, to send speeding information from the bicycle speedometer for your phone or something like this. And at the moment, we are working on a GAT API. GAT is the generic attribute profile, so you can have a debug API to be able to implement your own profiles outside of Bluetooth D, be them uh, Bluetooth SIG specified profiles or manufacturer specific profiles. And also we are working on moving the general connection establishment procedure inside the kernel. So we are, we are defining the APIs for that and, and writing this code. When we finish this move, the idea is to try to use the whitelist in the Bluetooth adapters to save power on, on the central side as well in the, in the connection. Okay, so that's what I had for you today. So if you have any questions, Uh, can you use the microphone, please? What about profile support on, uh, from the user space, like BlueZ? Uh, do you need to sup support the corresponding protocol? I'm sorry. Uh, like you have, this you're talking about kernel, right? Uh -huh. No, but also the user space demo is where the profiles are implemented. Yes, so is it implemented in BlueZ or BlueSolil or what? what it's is implemented there? in BlueZ, the Bluetooth D. What about the new Android blue, Bluetooth? Uh, you didn't implement better it. ask the Android guys about that. Okay. Anyone else with questions? Comments, maybe? 